I woke up in bed at like two o'clock in the morning. I hadn't been out drinking the night before, but it was like the walls are moving and stuff around you. But this was a little bit more severe. Later on that day, I went to my, at that point, just my normal doctor, just to see, you know, what was going on. And so I went for an MRI and the doctor had said, we can officially call it MS, but I've seen enough brain scans to know that where the lesions on my brain were, that you have MS. I didn't have any physical uh, limitations at all because I could, in essence, hide it very easily from whoever because I didn't have any stuttering or speech problems. I could play sports, run. One of uh, my passions is photography and I've been in taking photos since high school, you know, nothing was affected initially, except that first two in the morning episode. Glenn and I have been married 15 years. It was a while after he was diagnosed before cognitive issues started showing up. And I started noticing that he would be forgetful of a word or um, trying to think of a TV personality or something and couldn't come up with a name. And that was very unusual for him. I didn't want to overreact, um, but then, you know, some other things started showing up. Uh, it would take him a little bit longer to get going on a sentence, um, and it was more than just a stutter. When he spoke, his stories would just kind of go on and on. There wasn't really a start, middle, and end, and I think that's when I was finally like, I think there's something more going on here. Cognition is the most complicated human construct that there is. It really consists of the ability to take information from the environment and attend to that information, uh, pay, uh, sustain that attention, and if that information is important, to learn it and then store it somewhere in the brain so that it can be processed later on. So really it consists of taking information, storing it, processing it, and acting on that information. All of that is cognitive processing. OMS is very individualized, uh, so you see a lot of variability, but in general, you can have some general rules about the types of cognitive problems. So processing speed seems to be an area that's, that's pretty common. Learning and memory is also probably the, it, the area that's been studied the most, and the problem seems to be primarily in a difficulty learning information to begin with, as opposed to retrieving information from long-term storage or perseveration coming up and, re and resisting other alternatives. You might know what the right answer is, but you can't plan how to do the right answer. These are very significant problems and which are often interpreted by the patient or the family as a memory problem. But in fact, they may not be a memory problem. And so therefore, the proper assessment is critical. In the beginning, when I was first diagnosed, I pretty much suffered with fine motor issues, like a pins and needles. Many of my symptoms were visible, but then I also had invisible symptoms. Um, the invisible symptoms were more so in, in terms of my emotional well-being as well as the pain that I was feeling. As my symptoms started to change, it made me wonder in terms of what my journey of MS is going to be like. When I had mobility issues, immediately I was thinking, okay, will I ever be able to walk again? Will I ever be able to go to work again? Things like that. And I'm a single woman. I don't have anyone, you know, I don't have any kids, and um, it's just me. So if I can't do it, how does it get done? It made me start thinking about what's my future's gonna be like. And then on top of having those thoughts, I'm going through everything that's going on in my workplace. I found it harder and harder to get to work. Once I got to work, I found it harder and harder to concentrate. I'm very social. As long as there's gas in my car, I'm gone. <laughs> But the thrill of getting in my car and traveling and going somewhere new and even seeing friends, I didn't want to. And this became my routine. Mood is the internal, persistent, subjective, emotional state of the person. And there's disorders of affect, which is the external expression of mood. For example, if one has a depression, one will feel sad most of the day, nearly every day, and lose interest in all the things you're usually interested in. It's associated with concentration and attention impairments, 
uh, low self-esteem, and sometimes, in severe cases, suicidal ideation. Depression is, is sadness, but it could also be irritability. And sometimes you get a combination of the two. So a loved one starts noticing a change in the person's behavior. They become a bit more short-tempered or a bit snappy. They do things that are out of keeping with their usual character. You might be sleeping badly, your appetite changes. You can lose your sexual drive. When it becomes, you know, depression becomes more severe, you have thoughts of self-harm. Another disorder of mood that occurs in multiple sclerosis are anxiety disorders. It's not known what the prevalence of many anxiety disorders are in MS, but we do have a number of research studies that have demonstrated that clinically significant levels of anxiety, that is a level of anxiety that will kind of cause the person a great deal of distress and impair their functioning, is highly prevalent in MS. And I guess it's no surprise that MS could precipitate anxiety. It's an uncertain, unpredictable disease, and the person has to deal with things that they've never had to deal with before. I was trained as a doctor, and I had just come back to the States so that my kids would start uh, high school here. With the mood changes, it was difficult, but it became more apparent when I started fighting with my husband without no reason. The relationship with your husband or your significant other can become really strenuous because at the beginning, there's no understanding why things are happening the way they were, um, and you end up fighting until you realize, like, okay, hold on a second, this is not our usual relation, what's going on there. Last year was really bad. I would get really upset when it was 4 o'clock in the winter and it was dark and I was alone, and I, he would come up home and I would just explode without no reason. We decided that maybe part of the problem was that I was alone in the house. I realized I was having cognitive changes when I started um, forgetting things that I needed to do. The worst was one when I almost burned the house because I had forgotten I was cooking. I brought it up to my boss because I was worried about keeping up with, with the workload that I have. And she said, but you're doing fine. There's no trouble. I was talking to her and I said, you know, the problem is that I started at this level, you know, and I know I've, I have come to this level and it may be that this level is the normal for the rest of the people, but for me, it's not. Both disorders of mood and cognition are very prominent symptoms of MS epidemiological studies on the frequency of how often these disorders occur in MS suggest that severe disorders of mood occur in up to 50% of persons with MS. Disorders of cognition also occur in between 50 to 60% of persons with MS. There's fairly robust evidence now to show that depression is a brain disease in multiple sclerosis. With mood, it's more complex because of the lives that we lead and how social factors can influence how we feel. That said, there's now a growing brain imaging uh, database showing that particular changes in the brains of MS patients are linked to depression. It is a very complex question to try to address what causes changes in mood and mood disorders in MS. We know that it is highly likely that some of the mood disorders, particularly depression, are caused by living with an unpredictable uh, disorder that can exacerbate, remit, progress, and there is a great deal of uncertainty that the person with MS has to adjust to uh, in living with this disease long term. The relationship between disease-modifying therapies and depression in MS is very clouded. It was thought earlier on that the interferons could precipitate and cause depressive episodes in MS. Subsequent research has not found that that clearly is taking place. When it comes to mood and cognition in people with MS, we think they're overlapping conditions. We think that, that mood can um, cause, cognitive, cause cognitive impairment of its own. And then also when people think that they're 
cognition is, is impaired, that they think they're having thinking problems. Many times it's because they have some problems with depression. Depression can cause perceptions that our thinking is poor, and it can also cause real worsening of our thinking abilities. The cognition probably two, three years ago, it started. It was small things. Looking back, I realized that I don't really leave my apartment without double check and triple checking to make sure I have my phone, my keys, whatever it may be. But I forget so many other things. I'll, I'll be at the elevator of my hall to go down and then have to run back to my apartment. Or I'll be in the lobby of my building and have to go back up to get my whatever I forgot. I can't pinpoint a moment that was told me that MS is definitely affecting my cognitive type of things. It was more of a overall feeling, um, consensus in my brain that things weren't, you know, lining up proper, pro properly. So we had gone through a number of figuring out how to deal with different symptoms already. This was just sort of another hurdle that we, you know, had to get over. Not that forgetting a word affects your life in any drastic way, but it starts making you realize that, you know, there's brain processes that are being affected, thought processes, um, and, and it's a little scary because you're not sure where it's gonna go. I got to a point where I was starting to feel uncomfortable in the car driving with him. I finally put my foot down and said, I, I, I don't feel safe in the car with you anymore while you're driving. And that was a really, really hard one. Um, there's so many things about MS that take away freedoms that you have, take away your ability to do things you wanna do. Cognitive problems really have a vastly significant impact on everyday life. Five years post-diagnosis, up to 70% of people have become unemployed and largely because of cognitive problems and fatigue. Um, so it's a huge impact on employment, on family life. Just imagine, you know, no longer being able to help your daughter with your homework. Impact and socially with your spouse. Things are not the same, you're not the same person. You know, we can't do the same things. Um, so socially, family, economically, financially, a huge impact. Cognitive problems, without a doubt, has, a, has an impact on symptom management and self-care. You can imagine forgetting to take your medications. The first step is to go talk to your doctor and, and say, uh, things are having some difficulties. Your doctor may do a kind of a simple test of mental function um, with you in the office to see how things are going, but often those tests aren't that sensitive or specific for cognitive impairment in people with MS, so they, your doctor, he or she may refer you to uh, uh, another person to do a more thorough assessment. It might be a neuropsychologist, it might be an occupational therapist, it might be a speech pathologist, depending on where you live, for some to do a bit more thorough assessment of your cognitive abilities. The importance of a thorough neuropsychological assessment is that it will show clearly the person's cognitive strengths and cognitive weaknesses. That serves as a template for a treatment plan for rehabilitation. Cognitive rehabilitation is kind of like physical therapy for the mind. You know, it, physical therapy isn't going to make the lesions go away that, you know, impair walking ability. And cognitive rehabilitation is, are, is not going to make the lesions go away that have impaired learning and memory. But physical therapy can significantly improve walking and balance. And cognitive rehabilitation can help the person learn by using their cognitive strengths to compensate for their cognitive weaknesses. So the neuropsychological assessment serves as the framework that allows the neuropsychologist or the speech pathologist or the occupational therapist to develop a remediation plan that is individually tailored to that person. They're largely either computerized or paper and pencil tests in which the person is asked questions to determine can they learn and remember things as well as they should for a person of their education and age? Can they attend to and concentrate uh, as well as they should for a person, again, of their education and age? Differentiating cognitive problems from MS from to normal aging is, is complicated and really requires a sophisticated evaluation. The number one problem 
in MS, perhaps is processing speed, the number one problem aging is processing speed. A lot of cognitive rehab focuses on compensating for the problem. And we have specific techniques that we can do that, and they can be very effective. If in fact you're having difficulty processing information because of slow processing speed, we have ways to help you process, make sure you process that information. If you process the information, you can then learn it. And if you learn it, you can then remember it. That's compensating for a problem. Is that making your processing speed faster? No, but it's working with your processing speed issues to make sure it, you're effective in everyday life. And I think that that's the best way right now to deal with cognitive problems with persons in MS. It's been more of processing speed, um, like it takes me longer to, um, to think or to see or to follow the steps to realize what steps I need to take. And also it takes me longer. If I read something, sometimes I don't realize what I'm reading and I have to reread it. The other thing that um, we realized that I had to stop was driving because I started getting lost. Or all of a sudden I would be in a, in, a, in a place and I would look around and I'd say, where am I going? What am I doing, you know? It took me a couple of years to, um, to talk to my doctor about it. I told him, you know, I have these issues. It would be nice to know if it's really true or if it's just my imagination that I'm just getting, you know, too tired to do stuff. People think that fatigue is strongly associated with cognition. Uh, for example, when someone feels tired, they assume that they don't think as well. As it turns out, if you ask someone to complete certain tasks of memory or attention, they actually can rise to the occasion even if they're feeling tired. On the other hand, if they're doing a task that requires a lot of vigilance and they're paying tremendous attention, over a period of time, their performance on that task will slow. That's known as cognitive fatigability. But most people, when they describe fatigue or mental fatigue, they're, they're more describing a perception of how they feel as opposed to, gee, I'm slowing down over a five-minute interval. So we're still trying to dissect how that experience of fatigue really translates into real-life functioning. People appear to be able under certain circumstances to get the cognitive tasks done if they give themselves enough time. That's key. If they try to be as calm and non-stressed as possible. And if they can kind of eliminate distractions. People with MS have fatigue that can be very difficult to deal with. And people with MS can have cognitive challenges. How the two relate is not straightforward. They, no doubt there is an overlap, but it's not a one-to-one -one connection. One day at my doctor's office, you know, a simple question from my doctor of, so how's it going? In that moment, I just started to cry. And my doctor kind of looked at me and she's like, you know, you don't look like you. And of course that made me cry even more. And in talking to her, I kind of realized, you know, it's been months I've been feeling this way. This feeling of not me, of not wanting to go out, not wanting to be with friends, not wanting to do much of anything but be in my bed underneath the covers. Hopefully just turn my brain off and don't think about anything but trying to work through it got harder and harder. My doctor was like, understand, yes, life will throw you all kinds of curveballs, but having MS also can bring about emotional changes in you. It was like hearing it for the first time when she told me, you know, and I, and, and I, I kind of sat back and was like, you're right. I, I'm chalking it up to all of this being just life, but it could be the MS. So as my doctor and I started talking about, you know what, maybe you have a bit of depression. You ever thought about that? And I, at first I was like, nah, it's not depression. 
as I have tears boiling down my face. <laughs> Individuals who become sad can also withdraw. They may lose interest in activities that formerly gave them pleasure. They don't want to engage in things that they used to enjoy. And those kind of changes are often noticed very quickly by a spouse or by children. Depression is also going to affect other people uh, in that person's life as well, their spouse, their children. So you're really looking at a syndrome that is very, that is very significant, that can determine all aspects of a person's life. There has been a number of studies that have found that depression, particularly severe depression, is associated with poor performance at work in persons with MS and job loss. There have been a, a number of treatment studies to date that have demonstrated that both antidepressant therapy and psychotherapy, particularly a type of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, has been found to be effective in ameliorating the symptoms of depression in MS. So there are options out there for successful treatment of mood disorder in MS. Then there's also cognitive behavior therapy. There's a clinical trial in which they compared CBT to one of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, one of the antidepressant drugs, uh, sertraline, Zoloft. And they found that CBT and the medication were equally effective. Uh, and you don't get the side effects from CBT, of course, that you might get from, from antidepressant medication. There's another interesting finding that CBT can be administered over the telephone effectively to MS patients. And I think that's a very important uh, result because we know that our patients can have difficulty coming into clinic. When my doctor first um, talked about the idea of medication, I'll be honest, I was a little bit resistant, just a little bit, um, because there's sometimes a stigma that comes with the word depression. So my doctor also gave me something, as she put it, just to take the edge off. And it worked. You know, it wasn't one of those things where it worked just like that. No, no, it wasn't a quick fix. Um, but I noticed that in time, in days, I didn't want to stay in bed as long. I wanted to go out, maybe take a walk. I wanted to go out and drive somewhere in my car again. Things that I like to do, I wanted to do again. I wanted to hang out with my friends again. And then it got to a place where you couldn't keep me in the house. <laughs> All I wanted to do was be out in the world again. We've done some studies looking at people who have depression, major depression, and MS. We've looked at the ability of um, those individuals to become more physically active or to exercise and the impact of that on their mood. They might walk, some people might just stand more, they might go to the gym, they might swim, they might run, but whatever they can do, becoming more physically active has been shown to have a positive effect on mood. Doing what you can, doing a little bit more, setting a goal and achieving those goals in terms of physical activity can really build on themselves and build you back to being able to do things that are very meaningful and pleasant for you. So people can do a lot on their own to kind of keep their mood up, seek out social support, be with people who love you, who care about you, and, and stay close to those people. Be engaged with your family, friends, your community can all help. Let's say you're in another social situation and you know that your slow processing speed is going to affect your learning and your memory. And you're at a, you're at a party and there's a lot of noise. Stop people. Say, let me make sure I got that right. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. And feel comfortable with doing that rather than getting depressed and upset and, and avoiding those situations. You want to be able to feel comfortable. I'm the kind of person that if I have a problem, I look for a solution. You have to look what works for you, but if you know you need help, you have to find it because it makes a lot easier your life. We discussed that a company having a dog would help since we had had dogs before and it was quite a while since we had a dog. In reality, Bonbon is a rescue, but he rescued me. He's all love, so he only wants to give you love and he wants to receive love. So um, in that sense, it's, it really calms you down. I don't feel that alone. I don't feel that depressed. I don't get that anger inside me that much. And um, the other good thing about the dog is that he had made me move again, which I was staying mostly sitting down working in the computer or at bed working in the computer. He makes me get up, you know, to feed him. He makes me get up to get him out, you know, to the yard. Even though I don't walk him, I roll in my scooter and he walks around. 
I started to socialize again with the neighbors that have dogs. <laughs> and um, now he has dog day, play dates, which, you know, makes me talk to the neighbor and, and getting his back my confidence. The sticky notes have become my, my way of life, basically. I put sticky notes everywhere and I write down everything. And, and even if I know what I want to do, I still write it down so I make sure that I accomplish what I need to do. Cooking-wise, um, I figure out that if I do things in steps, um, instead of trying to do things all of a sudden, I do better. Or I depend on the timers, basically, uh, on everything else. I like to bake a lot. So that's one thing that I can still do. You know, I can bake. I was able to do a, a um, five-tier wedding cake for my son. You can do something to help your cognitive problems. If you have a primary problem, let's say, in learning and memory that's due to differences and changes in the brain, chances are you can help that get better, but it's not going to get back to normal. However, there are ways to work with those problems and so that you can be effective in society. How you define effectiveness is how well do you interact in your world, not how well you do on a memory test. When it comes down to cognitive impairment and what to do about that, we can think of it in kind of two broad domains. One is kind of how do I compensate for the impairments that I have? And the other is, can the brain improve? You know, can we improve actually how the brain functions? So in terms of compensation strategies, there's many, many compensation strategies out there. And most of us, everybody uh, uses them to one degree or another. It's just that a person with MS might have to use more or different ones. So we use things to, re to organize ourselves, to schedule ourselves as reminders, as memory devices. We can use paper you know, uh, organization tools. When it comes to um, remembering information, people with MS can you know, remind the people that are talking to them that maybe they could maybe speak more slowly or, or you know, they can give themselves some time to repeat the information that they need to remember. I think there's a lot of exciting research in really, can we, can we improve how the brain functions? Exercise, aerobic exercise for six months actually changes the brain. So um, uh, it causes new cells to be born um, in areas that, that uh, serve memory function and, and actually improves memory function a bit. So um, we're excited for the potential of aerobic exercise to improve um, uh, learning, memory, and probably especially speed of information processing. There is a, quite a bit of research now to show that there are behavioral techniques to improve one's learning and memory. But they can really help in everyday life. So as if we know that the problem is in initial learning of information, then what we do is make sure you learn to begin with. So there are lots of different ways to do this. Um, one way is to um, space learning trials apart. So let's say you're reading a newspaper. So let me read this article three times so I get it right. Well, we know if you read it three times spaced apart by, let's say, 15 minutes, you'll remember that information better than if you just read it three times in a row. There have been uh, several randomized clinical trials that have been published that have shown that verbal learning and memory problems can be remediated in persons with MS. And those uh, improvements in verbal learning and memory are associated with changes in the brain on functional magnetic resonance imaging, you know, showing better network connectivity in the brain. Cognitive reserve refers to the ability of our brains to kind of go around, work around areas of impairment. And uh, some people are able to do this more, some people are able to do this less. And um, what we know is that there are some things that are kind of hardwired, maybe genetically, like how large your brain is, how many different pathways it has. But, and some things are based on our environment, like in our childhood, did we, how far did we make it in school? Did we uh, study music? So some of that's kind of in the past. But the exciting thing is, is that it's, we seem to be able to even shape our cognitive reserve in later in adulthood. So um, the extent to which we travel, the extent to which we use our minds, stimulate our minds, do you know, exciting, challenging mental activities seems to also 
um, improve our cognitive reserve. And the more cognitive reserve we have, the more our brain is able to kind of find pathways around areas that might get damaged and be able to kind of serve that function, we kind of still get from A to B, but in a different route. If you have a problem with your arm, just to hurt, you go to the doctor. Because maybe there's something going on, uh, maybe they can help. If you have a problem with your thinking, you don't want to, uh, to, to not look into that, just like you would look into any physical problem. You want to find out, is there something that's going on? What is it? And what can I do about it? One of the things I do to combat my cognitive issues is that if I know it the night before, say, that I need to bring X, Y, Z, I'll make sure I have that ready to go by my phone, which I know I need to bring with me. The advent of touchscreens like your phone or iPad has been great. If I make a list on the phone or uh, iPad or laptop and send it to, to one of the devices, then I have a typewritten thing of what I need to take and I can reference that to make sure I have everything I need. I'm just thankful that I can, even though through all the shakes and whatever, um, the the, and the cognitive issues and the physical limitations, I am grateful that it had not robbed me of being able to see the picture I want to take and picture I'm, I am still able to take. I can still hit a button to snap the shutter. I've learned to adapt with my digital camera with the monopod and stuff and the the vibration reduction, take pictures. I want to do that. I've learned to uh, take life as it comes and be happier with experiences instead of things. One of the things that's so inspiring about Glenn is how driven he is and how dedicated he is to making sure MS doesn't take anything more away than it needs to. We're both dedicated to experiencing the world and life and taking advantage of every opportunity we can do for as long as we can do it.